the meeting to order. We're right on time here. Thanks. You're on the record. All of you. Yes, you can. Thanks all of you for um, coming on this wintry morning. Um, I myself just returned from uh, Antarctica, where it's summer. <laughs> but it's pretty much like this. I think it's warmer than, than it is today. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I will tell you that American Airlines uh, really treats Antarctica as the end of the world. <laughs> it's very difficult to get there and really hard to come back. Uh, but I'm glad that I'm here. <laughs> it's, good to, it's always good to, to come home. <laughs> So anyway, um, thank you all, and let's start with um, uh, yes. Yeah, so we have the special ed uh, testimony. We I had uh, because I was gone. We had some uh, communication problems about that. So I, apologies to Katie, um, but uh, she is going to um, uh, testify uh, to us or give us kind of an overview of um, some concerns about special ed that uh, she wanted to call our attention, but the other people that she was trying to get to testify will not be with us today. Um, so, Katie, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Morning. Um, thank you. Senator Ingram for uh, having the time today on our agenda to talk about special ed and the impact that it can have on families, especially those living in poverty here in Vermont. I myself am a family that navigates and struggles with poverty here in Vermont. And despite a lot of really hard work by my husband and myself, who both work, uh, we continue to struggle. And one of the things that really became apparent to me this year listening to testimony here is that it is really helpful to get the human aspect of it and, and how that actually looks for families. So today, I want to give you a little bit of my experience, both as a parent and also as a parent advocate. Uh, in the last year here in Vermont, I have decided to take on more of a active role as a parent advocate in special education. And in March, I made a public comment at my son's, I have three kids, I should probably back up, I have three kids. My daughter's 14 and she has no special needs, um, but has two younger brothers with some challenging special needs that take a lot of our attention and time to help them navigate the world, whether that's with medical providers, with other kinds of providers, and also with special education. I have a 12 year old son who's in seventh grade and has been on an IEP since kindergarten. And I have a six-year-old son who is now in first grade and has also been on IEP since he started school. My experience after I made a public comment in March was really unexpected. Since March, I've had over 100 families in Vermont who have contacted me about their experiences in special education looking for help. A large majority of them were from my school district, about 51 of them, I think. The rest of them were from many districts across the state. I've attended meetings and supported families now in 17 different schools. Most of them are in Chittenden County, but throughout um, some of the southern counties as well, in Grand Isle County. It was really hard, I think, at first to hear a lot of the experiences and not immediately assume that there were other places that someone could look for help. I immediately refer people to Vermont Family Network or to Legal Aid or to any of those agencies that can and usually are able to support families. Of the families that contacted me, about 75% of them had already made those contacts and were not able to get support whether it was because the agencies already had a pretty full caseload and they just weren't gonna be able to meet that family's needs in the timeline that they needed, or they didn't have the resources to take on the level of complexity that the families were dealing with. All of those families are families that are dealing with poverty and would not be able to afford a lawyer or an advocate on their own if they were paying out of pocket. When my family and I were struggling, this was a few years ago, but we were going through a complaint against my son's school for not providing 
three months of services in the IEP. And as we went through that process, it was great to see the people who did step up. There are many amazing people in our education system, and there are many amazing and passionate people who are fighting every day for our kids. Unfortunately, sometimes there are systematic gaps where families seem to fall through the cracks. Not because people want them to, but just because sometimes it's hard to see the level of need. And sometimes it's really easy for people who haven't experienced the system to not hear how important and impacting it is on families. When you are living in poverty, you're worried about whether or not you can keep a roof over your family's head, <coughs> whether or not you're gonna be able to feed your kids and provide them with all of the meals that they need without having to go to the food shelf or to call somebody to see if you can get some support. And a lot of times when you're struggling in poverty, you're also struggling with an inability to access health care or other services that are really important. So you're jumping through a lot of different hoops to try and meet the requirements of every program that you're accessing. So that might be meetings, that might be providing a lot of paperwork or filling out papers. And that might seem really easy, but when you're thinking about whether or not your children are able to even attend school because there are so many challenges and you're getting 25 calls a week about something going on at the school, whether it's minor or not, that's really hard to work. And it's really hard when you don't have the job security to be taking the time off to drop everything and, and help navigate things at school. And it was really surprising to me to see the impact that that can have on families in poverty. Because if you're choosing between your children's future and their education, and maybe your medications, if you're disabled and you don't have adequate health coverage yourself, and it comes down to getting to pay for your child's field trip, or getting to pay for something they need to be able to go to school, a lot of families are having to make the choice to not pay for their medication, or they're having to make the choice to call out of work knowing that they don't have the benefits to provide them with paid leave, or oftentimes knowing they're putting their job at risk to make sure that their children are able to have an education. A large number of the families that I've supported or communicated with don't need a lawyer. They don't need somebody who's going to, to come in and fix everything and do everything for them. They really need somebody who's going to explain to them what their rights are, what the process is, what the avenues to navigate anytime there's a dispute without having to have somebody do it for them. A lot of these families don't understand what their rights are as parents. And so therefore it creates a lot of tension between them and the school districts because the school districts are doing their best, but when they have all of the families to support, it's very easy for things to get lost in translation, for lack of a better word. I was very surprised to, when I looked at the numbers of the families I've been communicating with and when I thought of my own, to hear some of the amounts of wages that were lost in IEP meetings or navigating school districts. And I was also really surprised to hear the amount of trauma that a lot of these parents and families are dealing with as a result of their experiences. When you as a parent walk into an IEP meeting or into a meeting with all of your son's providers and you're the only one in the room that doesn't work for the school district and there is eight, nine people at that table with you, it is really intimidating. And unfortunately, there are times where, despite the best interest and, and best efforts of everybody at the table, communication breaks down. And when push comes to shove, as a parent, you do not really have a ton of say in, in that process. And unfortunately, a lot of times it seems like parent voices are being lost. 
parents are having to choose which conversations they can focus on because they don't have the ability to take on everything that needs to happen. There are a lot of parents who have learned the regulations and processes and what should be in an IEP and what progress monitoring looks like so that they themselves can be that advocate, but unfortunately that comes at a cost. We talk a lot in here about generational poverty and how we can help parents better their situations and get on their own two feet and be financially stable. But if you are in five, six meetings a week, whether that's an IEP meeting or meeting with the behavioral team or meeting with the nursing team or meeting with the math specialists, and then you have to also get your child to whatever outside providers they might be engaging with. And you also have to worry about making sure you can pay your bills and that there's food on the table and still get time with your kids. There's not a lot of time to go to school or to worry about whether or not you should think about going back to school so that you can have a better job, so that you can have better benefits. If you, as a parent, are in a position where you're doing your best for your child and you're really thinking about their future, their education is important. Most parents I've spoken to will put their children's education above all else so that their children can, can have a chance to not be living in poverty. And when they do that, that is when they lose their jobs. They lose their insurance because they're missing appointments, because they're dealing with school stuff so that their kid can be in school, because they're worried if their child isn't in school, they're gonna get sent to truancy court because there's a law saying your kid has to be there. It's a double-edged sword, and everybody in the system is trying their best, but we really do need more funding in Vermont for support for parents in navigating the education system. Vermont Family Network is an amazing agency that does really amazing work, and over the last several years, their ability to support families has continued to decline because their funding doesn't allow them to attend meetings in person. It doesn't allow them to be as hands-on and involved as they used to be, so the parents that they used to be able to support are no longer actually getting that support from them. Oftentimes, it can be weeks before somebody's able to get back to them and have reviewed the documents, and by that time, things are getting really tricky, and a lot of times, parents are having to decide where they're focusing their energies. And, and it is hard to figure out which battle you should pick on what day. Mm -hmm. I would encourage our council to continue to engage in the conversation around special education, not just around accessing support for parent advocates, which um, in this last year, the Vermont Developmental Disability Council actually provided 11 people with scholarships to take a special ed advocacy course. And uh, I was lucky enough to be one of those. And it was really amazing to be able to learn more about what's happening nationally. But it was also really hard to hear how far behind Vermont is in a lot of areas around child find, identifying the children who have disabilities and need to be evaluated, around adequate evaluations, making sure that evaluations are being done in a timely manner, being done by qualified professionals, and being done in a way that is transparent and accurate. It was also really surprising to hear that Vermont is pretty far behind in terms of the way that we're supporting the families with special, specific learning disabilities and requiring families to wait until their children are significantly behind or significantly delayed in areas to be able to adequately access those supports and services which is not the way a lot of other states do it. Um, in, in many other states, that is not a gate that families have to navigate. <clears throat> it would be very helpful to families who are living in poverty, who don't have the money to, to hire a lawyer or to hire an independent evaluator so that they can be sure their evaluations are accurate, to be able to access support whether it's parent advocates, whether it's increasing access at Vermont Family Network or legal aid, or, or anywhere. I think it's just important for us to think about 
this conversation because unfortunately it is really uncomfortable to talk about for a lot of reasons. It is hard to talk about the systematic areas where we're, we're maybe dropping the ball for these disabled children. But if we're not willing to engage in the conversation and start addressing the trauma that these families are going through for their children, we are only going to continue to see these families struggle in poverty and for the generational <coughs> poverty system to, cycle to continue. Um, I think that's all I want to say today. I apologize that it's not more um, thought out. I, I definitely just wanted to give you guys a bit more of a perspective from a parent who has spent a lot of time really learning the system and I myself am still struggling. This past week I, I intentionally wrote down how many communications or how many hours I spent navigating for my own two children. So I had more than 27 phone calls. I spent more than 15 hours either in meetings, on the phone, or reviewing documents in just one week for my two children, on top of being disabled and working full time. It is not reasonable to expect families to do that on their own, especially families who are struggling with getting their basic needs met and those who don't have the education to do so. And I think that the more that we can provide families with resources and support, and also school districts. School districts are, are doing the best that they can and maybe just need a little bit more support from either the agency of education, our, our elected officials, or maybe the agency of human services would also be a good place to look at the impact that trauma is having on families living in poverty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Appreciate your perspective. Um, question from Representative Coopley. Um, <clears throat> Kate, special ed advisory course, who, who was was that out of the agency, or is that something that some other organization had? So the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council made the decision to put some funding in their budget for um, special ed advocates. And there is a national organization called the Council of Practicing and or Parent and Practicing Attorneys. And they have actually created what is, and I'm thankfully in seat two now, so I'm taking the full year intensive. It's a national class, it's, it's uh, online, and it meets weekly, and it is actually what they're working on for the professional regulation of special ed advocates um, nationally. But it is a national course through the COPA agency that the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council decided to fund. There, um, go ahead. There, there's a budget line item for them. They are funded through AHS to um, human, services. human services. But I'm just trying to think of which budget I think it might, you know, they have their own. Secretary, and it's de there's one, one de that, I mean, it's dedicated in law exactly who should serve on the right. advisory council, yeah. right. families mm -hmm. and, and right. uh, parents of children and that type of thing. But it's, it, that's not <coughs> that's what not that's that's not I do that. think it is okay. important to know. have an advisory council on special ed that is functioning under, yeah. and, and we. I do think it's important to note about that, that there are a large number of parents who have submitted applications and shown interest right. in being a part of that that are even getting responded to. There are some issues with it uh, that, that we're trying to, that the past couple of years we've tried to uh, amend and make sure that uh, the state's following the rules according to the federal, um, according to the law that we have. So this course was um, something that the Developmental Disability Council spent some time looking at avenues to get more parents educated and informed. Um, this is the first time that Vermont had actually had a cohort. Um, there was 11 of us that took the first seat, and I'm actually the first Vermonter to take the second one. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you mentioned one <clears throat> entity that helps, that they just need. Who, who did you say was? Vermont Family Network? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, with them not familiar, they do good work. Are you just saying that we just need to give them more money? They, they have had a decrease in funding or they've been level funded and they're not able to have the staff on, on site that is able to attend meetings or, or provide the supports that they were able to provide several years ago. Okay, so that's yeah. simple, unfortunately, simple but not easy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the second, my second question, do the family, uh, uh, Parent-child centers provide any help for 
people in your situation? So they provide a certain level of help, but unfortunately, again, there's another agency that has a large amount of families who are seeking their support and very limited resources. They tend to refer people to Vermont Family Network or Legal Aid, and I myself who have, I worked at Vermont Family Network, have a lot of interaction with Vermont Family Network, often find that they aren't able to help because of the level of complexity. And with legal aid, um, every time that I've contacted them or, or supported a family in contacting them, the response has been that it's not something that they can take on right now. Um, and, and usually that's the end of the conversation. Your um, concerns with the education system, is, are you talking about kids having needing particular kinds of approaches to their education that they're just not getting, or is it more subtle I, than that? I would, I would advocate from my experience that there are a large number of compliance issues, whether they are intentional or unintentional, the IDA is not always followed. Uh, I actually had a reading specialist tell me that they don't know what IDA is, but they don't follow that in their district. And that's the law, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and I would, I would say a reading specialist who is also a part of the special education field would uh, need to have the knowledge of what the IDA expectation is in order to actually be able to provide students with IEP services. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add, I think Vermont Family Network specifically serves Chittenden County. They um, oh, serve statewide. the state. Most statewide. statewide. And that, Statewide. Yeah, statewide. But Vermont Federation of Families is all another partner organization to that that also has parent. Does the same work and is statewide. And used to have peer navigators in every county, but lost that funding a number of years ago and hasn't been able to get it back. So basically it's volunteers now and it's very small. And again, you, even when you have a lot of really passionate, qualified volunteers or, or staff, um, unfortunately they're limited by their time and their ability to serve more families because they only have a limited amount of time. Yes, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Did you have a question? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody, does. No, somebody else says, thank you. Just, there are clear guidelines um, if people are not compliant with special ed law and regulations and the agency of education would support those. I mean, they should be supporting those. They should, you're right. And there should be a system for reporting um, issues like you had with that person saying that in that district. Um, and Help Me Grow could also be another resource if the FN, like they can't go to meetings, but they could talk about your rights and refer you to information. Unfortunately, that then puts the expectation on a family to be able to navigate that. And when you're thinking about families who may not have an education level themselves, that is a bit, I've done it. I've, I've gone through the administrative complaint process. I've contacted the AOE countless times. And most often you get a response, unfortunately, that just tells you to contact another person or provides you with a link with information you already know, but doesn't necessarily address it. I can't tell you how many times I've contacted the AOE and, and provided them with documentation showing that there is something going on and a, and a family needs help and ask them where to go. And I got told that there was nothing that they could do or, or at other times didn't even get responded to. <coughs> so yes, there are many great systems in place and there are many great agencies doing a lot of great work. Unfortunately, I think one of the areas that we do need to look at is accountability and transparency and ensuring that the services that are being provided and paid for already by the state are actually quality services and that they are what the children need and not just what um, is the norm for that district or that agency. Um, just the short story to punctuate what Katie is saying. Um, I know a family very well in the southern part of the state whose son needed special education services and not really, it, it wasn't any behavioral issues, it was some specialized services and uh, literally they were told that in order to get those services you need to give your child up and sign over to the state um, custody. And, and she, had no, she had no assistance or parent advocate and she did that. And for years, this then was navigating the DCF system 
and unfortunately her son um, was abused and it, um, it, the trauma that it caused that whole family because she didn't have anybody there to under, help her understand. She had limited education, but was a mom just trying to do what she was supposed to do for her child, and that's what she was told by the education system. And if you're a new American and you don't even have a release in your language and you don't understand it, you're just signing things so that you can access those services, that must be very scary because you could be signing anything and not know it. And there are a large number of families who, who because they think it is the best interest, will just sign whatever they need to because they want to help their kids. When, when we were really struggling with my son and we filed a complaint and we did everything right, what ended up happening was the principal in that school started calling my landlord to check to see if we still had a lease when he knew our housing was gonna be in jeopardy and actually sent a police officer when I was in the hospital to my house and the, that police officer talked to my landlord and talked to my neighbors, which is a violation of McKinney Vento. And because of all of that, my landlord ended up wanting mm -hmm. to evict us. Mm -hmm. And we were luckily able to maintain for the remainder of the school year, but because of those actions, my family ended up homeless for two and a half years. All because we filed a legitimate complaint in the proper channels, and there was no one. I called every lawyer's office, I called every agency, I met with the governor and many representatives in the state house, and there was no one that would help me. So unfortunately, there are many areas where families are falling through the cracks despite the best efforts and when it is not of their doing. I just wanted to go back. Katie, thank you so much for sharing your story, first of all. I know this has been um, quite a road for you. Um, I, I just want to go back to something that you're saying about the Vermont Family Network. and. Um, what I understand to be sort of peer navigation and, and peer, um, that kind of peer support system is what you're talking about. And when I think about um, the potential for trauma exposure and the complexities of toxic stress in, in households where there are all of these numerous issues um, facing them, you know, poverty, special needs, all of those things. Um, I'm thinking about that chal the challenge that it is to keep your executive functioning, you know, online, right? And so there are times when it sounds like what you're saying is there is a definite need for someone else to kind of step in and help, help with that navigation, partner with you in that navigation, not make decisions, but to be someone who's that clearer thinker. At, when when you're just when you're just heaped with all of that that toxic stress, um, and so so I guess my question to you would be then um, if sort of on the weight of because because some of the answers are simple but not easy, um, where would you place the weight of the resources? Would you want to see that more in peer navigation? Would you want to see it more with the programs beefing up the programs? I know that ideally it's all of the above, right? But I'm just saying like. If you, if you had to, if somebody said to you, like, Katie, where, where do you weight the importance? You know, like, what do you, you know? I think that, like you said, all of them would right. be the answer. Right. Right. Um, myself, I was diagnosed with PTSD because of the issues that I had with my son in school. And it has definitely been a hard road to figure out how to deal with my own trauma. And what I've learned from that is it makes me much more compassionate, empathetic, and able to sit next to somebody else in an IEP meeting who I know has gone through similar trauma and see them completely triggered and unable to even be engaged in the conversation because in that moment, they are stuck in the, the trauma that they've experienced, whether that is going into all of these meetings and having the school, in, in a sense, push back and, and maybe question your parenting or take your children or call DCF and make calls to DCF. I've had false 
claims made against me after my complaint. So there's a level of fear for a lot of the parents and, and having somebody who has been there and navigated it that can say, hey, I'm here. You're, you're not alone. And I, t I, I actually support a parent who is dealing with this right now. And one of the best things she said to me was, when you tap and just let me know that you're sitting next to me, it brings me back in the room. And having another parent who's there, who's a peer advocate, and can say, hey, can we take a minute and actually step out with the parent, give them a minute to regain composure and to have empower them to come back in the room and not be stuck in that trauma, but be present in the conversation where it is. I, I would say that peer support and, and training for those peer advocates and that support around both trauma and the process and, and being a, a, a quality advocate at the same time is important. That would be an area where I would see as a, an important focus. Thank you. Um, in terms of what Katie's talking about the, in the peer navigation, both the Mount Federation of Families and the Mount Family Network are members of the uh, Mount Coalition Disability Rights and in our platform, and again this year, we have two sections that deal with um, uh, increasing funding and, and peer navigation. So I'll be glad I'll send those along to the council so you can see what we're talking about. Uh, with a couple of different ways that peer navigation works to assist families. Though. I think it is also important to just mention that a number of families who are navigating children with disabilities also at times have disabilities of their own, like myself, whether that's a physical disability or whether that might be their own dyslexia or other learning disability that impacts their ability to understand what's happening. Or when they're handed a, a ton of documents at the IEP meeting that they're supposed to be discussing those documents in, they're not able to be engaged and effective. And I would say they don't have their parental um, rights being met because they are not prepared for that meeting because they can't possibly be expected to read those documents in that moment and understand them quickly enough to engage in the conversation. We have the, I think we have the last question. Uh, so it's more of a step. So regardless, this council is one avenue of, of action or at least support, but you have four of us up here regardless of where we go. We are very much engaged in this and I'm very familiar with the Vermont Family Network, and they've empowered me, who my oldest son is now 41 plus, you know. Um, I walked out of a informational meeting when he was in, I don't know, kindergarten, that I to discover what that information meant for teaching a parent what their rights are. I walked out of there feeling like Rocky. You know, this, so I, and you play the music too. I didn't even know this door open. And so I can attest to the power of the empowerment. And so you've got many up there who will not forget what you've said today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. <laughs> 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 Rocky playing in my show. That's my jam when I go to my meetings. <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving on, um, we want to review the minutes of our last meeting. So we're going to actually, um, it, it's actually the October minutes. The October. The third, the third document in your packet. Um, it says minutes draft with October 24, 2019 on the top of it. Um, the caveat to your minutes that I wrote was that I was not here. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peggy Doyne was covering for the committee yeah. services supervisor. Um, I did the standard minutes for this committee, for this council, in that I hyperlinked committee testimony um, to the website where it exists. Um, with this one, it was a little bit different because there were so many witnesses mm. with so many different documents that this would have been a mess of hyperlinks. Mm. So what I did was I referenced, and as you can see on the screen really quick, what I basically did was each of those hyperlinks references this and goes to this. And so then you can say, okay, here's all the stuff that Auburn Watersong presented and, and here's Erhard. And that was the easiest way I could do it versus person by person, document by document. The second caveat that I need your help with is the attendance. Peggy, um, I did not communicate to her that she was supposed to take attendance of who was here and who was not. So um, I left it the same as the meeting before that, and I would uh, welcome any corrections that mm -hmm. anyone on the council has. 
Sounds good. Do you see your name if, and were you actually here? And, <laughs> 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 and if you, were, and if you uh, don't see your name if you were here, check your calendar. Yeah, right. Who remembers that? You're in the other way. Bust that up and I'll update these uh, immediately. Oh, I also wasn't here. Okay, sure. I wasn't here. Stacy, hello. So Stacy was not here? No, I don't think. Okay. Okay. I think I was here. Okay, Jenna. Passed around the signage. And Mike, I was there. Not, not Laura Bernard, but I was. There. It was you, Jenna. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I would accept a motion to um, approve the minutes with those uh, changes. So moved. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. All right, minutes are approved. Okay. I'm going to ask my partner in crime, uh, Katie McClendon, to come up and we can go over some of the notes from the, um, the off. site meeting in Rutland. That's the fourth document in your packet. Okay. Um, it's three full pages, and this is a compilation of. The big pieces of paper I was jotting notes furiously on, um, listening back to the audio from the meeting and the handwritten notes that were submitted. So this is a compilation of those, and there's much room for mixing things up in error in that. So please review them and let me know if there are changes to the meeting. So I was just saying that Mike did a great job of pulling all these documents together, and my only role was trying to read through to there are some that just didn't make sense or maybe. I thought it should be shifted in terms of what category they were in. Um, so take a look and see if you want to move anything into different categories or um, something that doesn't quite make sense. We were doing a little bit of guessing, trying to piece the conversation back together. <laughs> and during the time that the state house was completely closed and we were off-site working from home as well. That always helps. Can I just yes. ask a question? Is there <coughs> the order, is yes. there some sort of... Um, Right. Should I read something into that, but that may have had more? Okay, just your... That is, the, I think the order was the big pieces of paper kind of copying them down off. as they went. Yeah. yeah. Should there be an order? That's a good question for the council. Well, this is what people said. This is not yeah. uh, for us to say. Okay. It, might be helpful, and it might be helpful to know how many of the groups, because if all of the groups identified one category as a challenge, that might make it something that would be a priority. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody disagreed with that. It would be tough to do. Yeah. That would be a really yeah. tough thing to do. Um, I hear you. Um, we didn't identify each group as I was oh. going on the big things. I was just going, and, and then there was things on the sides. And, yep. Yeah, that would yep. be difficult. Would it, would it be safe to say on the wrap-up priorities that that was a more focused I think that's that the, the, that's the home in yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. kind of ranking. That third page, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. On, on the um, under unexpected cost, the down at the bottom of the second page. Yep. That in quotes, not about me without me. It's really nothing about me without me. Nothing. Okay. I think Great. that was just a shorthand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it probably was. Well, nothing about years, me. So nothing about us without us. Yeah. 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 Nothing yeah. about us yeah. without us. Yeah. yeah. So me should be changed to us? Or no? yeah, that's, the, that's, the more common, yeah. that's the more common. Yeah. That people will recognize. Yeah. Not, nothing about, about us without, without us. us. Gotcha. And I see two typos, mysterious T's at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for changes. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah definitely. It's not easy to pull together. It was a good, good meeting. A good yeah. 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 Oh, take that. Yeah, take that. Yeah, it. It. It's all about your relationship and your smile. That's right. <laughs> the Rutland folks were very welcome. They were. Yeah. That was really great. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, do, we, do we consider these minutes 
them? Should they be approved or are they just? I think we were going to treat them as minutes. At least okay. um, the minutes have to be included as part of the recommendations when we're filed. So I was going to include that as minutes. And they off site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I can add a header to it. That would be nice. Like the on. date and the location and things like It's kind of blank right now, but right. I can okay. add in a header. Okay. It's similar to our, our previous one. And, okay. and should we have members who were present at least? I can. Can I tell you now who is present? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Memory, yeah. Um, or we could send yeah. a we, sign out sheet around for the November meeting, sign in sheet, and if you were there, just sign your name and then write okay. picture. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Or just, just do it right, right now. Right now. Yeah. When you have it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can do that. So with those changes, I will make during this meeting. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, can we have a motion? Sure. I'll make a motion that we accept those as our November meetings with the adjustment. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay. So, so the mechanism I'll use is I'll send an agenda around, a separate agenda that says attendance at Rutland, and just cross your name off if you weren't there, and we'll go from there. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll check if we were there. So yeah, check if you were there. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's all I have. Maybe one to you. Thank you for what you do, folks. All right. Thank you much. Great. All right. So thank you, Katie. Um, so we'll follow the, the kind of format here that we <coughs> have listed. And that means Katie will walk us through what our charge is and um, what we reported uh, in 2018. Like paper and shuffling and moving. <laughs> <laughs> it's an occupational hazard. <laughs> I didn't see anybody else. <laughs> well, she, we were walking in from the, you know, from the parking lot. Like I've got a backpack and shoes and lunch and her, and, you know, and I'm dragging things. And I look over the senator, not you, senator, but I'm just a phone. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> That's what staff is for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Okay. We don't have any. Um, <laughs> staff takes care of. I look like I'm moving in every day. <laughs> I'm a big picture guy. <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry. Talk now. There we go. Okay. Please. <laughs> Um, so our task for today is coming up with the end of year recommendations. So I thought um, before we move forward, it would help to just take a step back and look at what you're required to do statutorily. Um, so Act 207, subsection D, specify what the work products are. Um, so first what I just referenced is the compilation of minutes, and I don't think that was actually done last year. Um, but what I plan to do is to just add an appendice onto our recommendations with the the reports attached, or the minutes attached, so that information is all together. But by January 1st of each year, the council is to submit its compilation of meeting minutes from the previous calendar year that summarizes the advisory council's activities. So, um, so we have them all finished, we just have to attach them to the recommendations. Part two, oops, I'm sorry. There we go. Part two is the recommendations, so that will probably be what we're most focused on uh, this morning, but by January 1st, the council is to submit a list of policy recommendations and legislative priorities from the previous calendar year to the General Assembly uh, to the appropriate state agency or organization that are aimed at reducing incidences or mitigating the effects of childhood poverty. So this is a change from um, the previous council where there was a full-blown report and this has been limited to policy recommendations, a list of policy recommendations. And then the third subsection is legislation, and we've passed the introduction deadline at this point for both the House and the Senate. So um, at this point, the, that's irrelevant unless um, a committee, um, a whole committee was interested in um, introducing a bill. So that is the charge. Um, and if it's helpful to folks um, to look at last year's report while we're moving through might put that back up so we could just take a look at, um, at what we had, the different categories, and work from there. Yes. If that's useful. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll share with you. Okay. Yeah, I also took the first two pages of the act, of the act and put it in your packets, which would be the charge. The, okay, 207. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I don't think we really need to walk through this, but. Um, there is just a statement purpose and authority, so that would 
remain the same as your statutory charge hasn't changed. And then this jumps right into the recommendations, and the recommendations were um, grouped together by subject areas. So there were recommendations on child care and early learning, after school and summer programs, uh, several recommendations on affordable housing. Um, economic empowerment and employee, uh, employment supports. Trauma and family supports. And then last year you had to come up with benchmarks. You don't have to do that this year. That was a, a one year, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> that was just a year one that's project. So, so that doesn't have to happen. So that's last year's report. And I know that several folks submitted recommendation suggestions already. So I think those are posted online as well. Great. Thank you very much. Any questions? Alrighty. So I was thinking we would just go through section by section, and um, and uh, yeah, yes, please do. Um, and modify or uh, add, well, some of these may have been sort of met, right? So you can probably help us figure out <laughs> if some of them have been achieved. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, then add add new ones. That sound like a procedure. So the very first uh, section is child care and early learning. Um, the advisory, we had three recommendations, increasing child care provider reimbursement rates within the child care financial assistance program to the most current available market rates, supporting an expansion of workforce incentives, including educational supports for child care providers, and expanding eligibility within the CCPAP. Is there a copy of that? Or oh, we can oh, give you a link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or can you just point us to the link? Yep, it's right on. Um, go back to this page. So it's um, final report 2018 at the under additional information. Are you on the um, page for today's date? Yes, well, I can do it when we get to the section, but the, the, the title that you have is Reach Up Recommendations, and those are not recommendations. Mm -hmm. Actually, I submitted the, the Reach Up Report from okay. January because there's some uh, uh, there's a section in that I, I wanted the council to take a look at when we get to the empowerment, economic empowerment section. I'll change the title of that. Yeah, just, just the title. It, it, it's oh. not recommendations. Of this, Karen? Yep. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. That, that case, boy, that, that's why I want to change the title of that. This is the, what I submitted was the re reach up report, um, the evaluation of reach up that was due to the legislature January of 2019. Yep. Because there's a section in there about financial capabilities I wanted to talk about. So we'll I've got your change. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. And, and I think the council should have that because there's other good things in that report you might want to look at. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, so since this was in our committee this year in human services yes. and since we in your committee yes. uh, we uh, we made significant progress on this this year however i would keep it as a continuing recommendation um we we are not yet at current um, right. available market rates we are closing in on that um we have one-time supports for workforce incentives and professional development but uh, we don't have ongoing support for that and we uh, did expand eligibility but it's we're again in process the child care financial assistance program you know is just really in year one of a five-year um, change um, process and so I, I would recommend that um, we update this to be reflective of the legislation and the budget that passed but that we keep it as a recommendation yeah. So I had a very similar, thank you, Representative, because I had said, well, the most current available market rate, we're not there, we did make movement, so that may, still made perfect <coughs> sense to me that we wouldn't, we still need to make movement toward that, that most current. And it's good that you remind us that it was one-time money on those other two, but yeah, all of those are still in flex and that we were one year of a five-year step. Yeah. But we do want to... Acknowledge what has been achieved. Yes. Because yes. otherwise, that yeah. becomes a response. Yes. That, you know, so, 
Yeah. That, that we've gone this far, we need to go further. Right, yeah. Does that, I think that's good. So, does that sound good, Katie? Yep. You, can, I just, can I just add one question or, okay. or uh, ask one question? Um, so, one thing that we, we didn't put in there is about accessibility. So, increasing access to and, and arguably, um, you know, increasing the assistance through CFAP increases access, but we're act I'm actually talking about increasing the actual numbers of child care providers and numbers of spaces for children in child care. And we are doing a lot of active work on that, and it's, it seems odd to leave it off. I mean, last year we didn't put it on, I don't know why, but it, um, so I guess I would amend my recommendation to add that as a DSD. D -S -D. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Do we need to specify how we would do that? Like pay, repayment of student loans or? Um... Well, what I was really thinking there is that, you know, we just put out 1.4 million in, uh, it's a partnership actually, a public private partnership. So okay. we've put some one-time dollars right. legislatively into yeah. it, but also the, um, the uh, no, I'm gonna forget the acronym, but, um, there's private philanthropy money that's already gone into that as well. Let's grow kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They're funding people. Right. I know. He's looking over there at me. I can't think of it. <laughs> yeah. but, um, so uh, so what we're talking about is increasing the actual capacity, the number of, of spaces available. And um, so it's, it's infrastructure, really. Okay. <clears throat> they could have had a union. They really child. <laughs> I know that we That's in the past. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, I'm going to go on. Indulge me 10 seconds of whining. That was before I was old. All right. Um, any other? Any other? Just that it remains one of the top things you, from even from the offsite meeting. Uh, you know, the child care. Mm -hmm. It's right. really yeah. important, so it's been, yeah, it should it's stay on. Yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. if you if you think it's not important to the economy as well, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston was here uh, about ten days ago um, and was really stressing. They've taken this up as a major issue for increasing uh, workforce and the um, support to the economy in our whole region. Mm -hmm. They've identified it as a priority. Yeah. One thing we heard about at the public hearing was access for second and third shift. I don't know if there's any way to include um, but variations in, in the time frame, because I know typically it's just that kind of daytime um, spaces. That's especially true given the importance of tourism in our state. A lot of people yeah. work in the ski areas and in the yeah. evening. And mm -hmm. Nursing. Yeah, good one. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Restaurants. <laughs> The you just put that as part of the watches. Add increasing access. <laughs> yeah. The rest of my hours. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, then, if everybody's satisfied with those changes, we can move on to number two, which is after school and summer programs. And so there's basically one overarching recommendation to increase investments in after school and summer programs to expand high quality programs and increase statewide access. Have we made progress <coughs> in that area? Did we? Yeah. Um, um, not the child care, the, 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 when we were talking about child care, um, that included after school programs mm -hmm. for those age cohorts. Um, I can't tell you exactly how much has gone to after school programs, but it, it included that group. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. I could, so I've been, you know, they, after school had, um, as it indicates here in the, the second paragraph of this report, you know they had they had some they had some boost mm -hmm. in um, seventeen eighteen. I think in the eighteen, the representative Wood has said it may have been underneath the, the uh, cohort of, of the child care, but not a whole lot that I can think of happened directly for them other than the fact that they were. Um, working and engaging with the supports that we had already just given them. So I would like to see that continue to be a priority within our, our council only well, for two reasons. Number one, because there's a lot of uh, discussion in the federal level that it's, it's been cut from the president's recommended budget. 
and that for the strength of our Senate and congressional people, it's been reinstated in the past, but I don't know where that's going to go. And so that's something to really worth watching. And um, um, I, I don't know if it's another time, but there's something else that I've been working with that I thought fit well within the after school cohort because I know that, remember a couple of years ago, people have been on here, we had the youth rights. Um, they met, youth across the straight state met in Randolph uh, on their yes. own with some support to come up with this sort of bill of youth rights or right, declaration of youth rights that we included not last year, but the year before in, in our uh, referencing. And um, there's maybe a mechanism that I've been working on with having heard from both Canada and, believe it or not, like Helsinki students, mm -hmm. that, that the whole country of Canada has passed this Youth Voice Act that um, encompasses their ability to have a voice a structured voice that comes into uh, decisions that are being made within their state government and well in this case would be state government um, um, that they want to have a voice in. So I had uh, checked with people that I will be introducing or working on a bill to see how to structure that. So I was hoping that maybe we could, we could offer it as something that we could support under the after school point. And I don't know, if, I don't think we, I don't think we passed it out but if you, it's only one Two sentences, rather run on, but can I just read it and then? Yeah, is that okay. Certainly. And then I just wanted to see if it would work in there or not. I, it was just yesterday that I really worked on it with some some people, but it would say that youth youth people, youth people, young people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, youths. Youths. <laughs> youths. <laughs> they live in. All right, <laughs> young people are problem solvers who are eager. To, to be engaged in making our state a stronger, healthier, and happier place to live. Vermont youth have collectively written a youth declaration of rights that we should um, recognize. Vermont should commit to requiring and collecting meaningful input and feedback from our young people, especially on policies that affect them. So I was hoping that we could maybe insert that and, um, mm -hmm. and I offer that as, as a possibility. Great. Yes. Thank you. So, so not really changing the. I mean, leaving the no, overarching leaving, right. thing, but adding right. that as a right. right. Uh -huh. Can I ask a question? Yes. Not about uh, of Representative Lamper. Um, so this referred to the six hundred thousand yeah. um, dollars in the tobacco settlement funding, mm -hmm. and uh, honestly, the tobacco settlement funding went through so many different changes mm -hmm. um, last year. Uh, can Can you confirm whether or not this stayed? It wasn't can anybody, can anybody, anybody here legislatively <laughs> yeah, no, confirm uh, whether or not this stay? Because I can't. No, not, yes, no, I, no, I think somebody there's somebody here, but I believe it was over a three year period and it wasn't taken away. Okay. We'll, yeah, we'll, uh, uh, right. maybe, yeah, we're thinking. So it was one time money, you're correct, it was through tobacco settlement. It was allocated over um, to two years and the, the grants have been already put out. Okay. Um, there was two and a half million dollars in requests and six hundred thousand dollars were granted. Okay. This one, you know, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. If it, if, it, if it didn't actually go out, it, it would have been right. Same. And yeah. so, do we? Uh, maybe we should update that section. Update that section. Saying that. Yeah. Uh, um, and so, um, can, I, can I ask Amy a question? Yeah. Did you, did you say there were two and a half million dollars worth of requests? So that just sort of aligns with the yeah. two and a half million shown by the, the after school council. We can provide details if you want. Um, I just I just feel like we should update it. Update the yeah. language. Yeah. Yeah. Is that clear? No. No? no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. I'm glad I asked. So what do you want? Well, it says, we, it says we allocated it and so we I guess we should say that we um, we made grant we made grants to however many organizations and Amy can give the, the details. Yeah. <laughs> so we can insert after that really uh, yeah, and, you know, and then we can just give some details as to what happened. So keep the first sentence and then yep. just have yep. some description. And yep. then do you want something about the 2.5 in requests or, or no? I, I think showing what the need is is yeah. part yeah. of what we should okay. do here. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be good, yeah. Okay. So I'll get that from you. Yes, thank you. Okay. 
And then, so then, how do people feel about uh, Senator, or, uh, Representative Lamper's uh, addition about voices for, of young people? Yeah, maybe that's good too. Okay. May I Thank take you. that from you? Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other additions and changes? Anything else? Okay, great. So we will move on to section three, which is affordable housing. Uh, we made three recommendations here. Um, the three-legged stool, uh, increasing capital investments to reduce the shortage of affordable housing in Vermont, for example, by providing full statutory funding for the VHCB. Uh, second, increasing rental assistance and other housing-related financial supports, for example, increasing funding for the Vermont Rental Subsidy and the Housing Opportunity Grant Program. And third, expanding investments in support services to increase housing retention for families, for example, by increasing funding for family-supported housing. Um, so these are kind of the three standard umbrella um, recommendations in, in this area. Um, I'm kind of looking in there hard. If there's anything you want to add or say about I'll just that. note, um, so uh, thanks uh, again for taking testimony on housing. And I, I think I'd add to the title, Affordable Housing and Homelessness, uh, mm -hmm. Family Homelessness, yeah. um, because we had uh, some compelling testimony uh, both on the Family uh, Supportive Housing Program uh, and its outcomes, its positive outcomes from uh, Emily Higgins at uh, uh, OEO, as well as uh, the positive outcomes from the uh, HOP or Housing Opportunity Grant Program. Um, so I, I mean, I think these can remain pretty much, uh, pretty much as is. Um, the uh, we provided a, a fair amount of um, data points and, and outcomes that uh, may update some of the um, uh, some of the narrative that comes after the uh, recommendations that's uh, supportive. Um, and I. You know, happy to work with uh, Katie. Um, you know, to highlight some of those, but they're all on the October um, meeting um, website. Um, so the only thing I might add uh, to this is, you know, just to put a finer point on it. Um, you heard from uh, Ellen uh, Hender at the um, uh, Upper Valley Haven about the positive outcomes for, uh, for and the need for more money for family supportive housing, and I, I, I would I would just say. That that's probably one of our that and, and the hot program are, are two of our highest priorities for, for uh, homeless families and, and alleviating that um, this year. And I'll, I'll just also add on the hot program uh, one thing that did not maybe receive as much attention. And I know um, Sandy uh, has talked about this in the past, but uh, one of the recommendations from Legal Aid is to increase rental arrearage assistance, which flows often through the hot program. Uh, to help, you know, kind of go upstream and help prevent evictions uh, to begin with for families that are having financial uh, difficulties and for whom uh, a month or two uh, or possibly three months of, of rental arrears might actually prevent the spiraling uh, downwards into homelessness. So I, I, I would maybe just say we could put a finer point on, on the HOP uh, and, and family support housing based on the, on the testimony that we heard. And, um, again, happy to work. Um, with, with Katie on uh, the kind of narrative the need statement. Um, maybe one other thing, we did hear testimony from 211 um, about the um, safety net and uh, loss of the 24 seven. That's since been restored, uh, at least um, through April for emergency housing. Um, and then uh, only um, from um, till the end of the fiscal year for the rest of their resource and uh, referral um, uh, services. And I, I, I would, I guess I would recommend putting in something about 211 uh, and fully funding uh, 211's 24 mm -hmm. 7 services for the next fiscal year uh, since that's going to be up for up for discussion uh, yeah. this, this winter. Interested as a dean here. Yes. Um, I, uh, one thing that I was, uh, I, would, I agree with that, Earhart, that recommendation. Um, and not that we direct people what to do, but um, you know, through the, the Halloween flood, it was clear that they were directing people to 211, which, you know, they sort of immediately put back to 24 hours somehow. Um, so it seems like it shouldn't just be incumbent upon the agency human services. And wherever that funding comes from, it should be collaborative. So ANR or Vermont Emergency Management, it should be a more comprehensive um, and therefore maybe more doable 
um, to get that to an ongoing 24 seven. But that wasn't really my comment. My other comment was, <laughs> my other comment was um, around the housing vouchers uh, and the supportive services. And uh, it feels like we should make a statement here about the lack of something more concrete um, since we know how many housing vouchers have gone unused because of the lack of supportive services. So there is um, a special, the, so there is a, a report that came out that was required on special use of specialized vouchers that has a series of recommendations in there. Um, one that I want to point out in particular is that that report actually suggests that Vermont rental subsidy be considered more flexibly instead of just increasing funding for to do Vermont rental subsidy as temporary rental assistance to consider. Vermont rental subsidy largely supports reach up families. Um, at this point in time, I think it's almost 100% reach up families because of the way that program is structured. And the legislative report suggests looking at ways that that funding can be used more flexibly to support reach of families who are who are homeless. And I think, in an effort to address maybe some of the imbalance between services and uh, subsidy, so that might be that's what's in that report. It's different than this recommendation, so that might be one thing to consider. But that report also has a series of other recommendations in it. So Sarah, can I just so people who had. And, and while our illustrious chair was traveling the world, I was trying to gather, or my, well, anyway, he, people who had responded from our council with, with ideas. And so I tried to keep it in one, and then Sarah, I did, you sent uh, an email with uh, an ask, or at least to take a look at with the specialized housing voucher group report. Mm -hmm. And, and she had indicated, thank you for saying what page it was on. <laughs> it's a long report. It's a long report. So she said on page 30, number two, and like dialed me, dialed it right in. Yeah. So I printed it, and so I was looking at you because that was one of, one of the many recommendations that are within this report that you had suggested maybe it might be something that fit in our world. So the language is here, right? Mm -hmm. And is it, it's number two. Number two. Which is... A, Consider increased flexibility in the way the Vermont rental subsidy is used to support housing sta sta housing stably, stability. stability to families of re families receiving reach up. Currently, VRs is an important housing resource that predominantly serves reach up families experiencing homelessness. Maintaining this resource to support permanent housing stability for reach up families is critically important at the same time considering the increased availability of federal rapid rehousing assistance, it may be helpful to consider more flexible options for the use of the, these funds to support housing stability for reach up families. It's kind of a lot. Would you, did you, do you want to maybe pare that down or? We could condense that, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure if you yeah. just use the first sentence, it would be. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> right, increased okay. flexibility is the most important thing for the subsidy to reach up All right, so I'm gonna pare that right off in that, that first sentence. Okay, is there is there another one? It also oh. speaks to family supported housing, which right. um, as you know, we yep. testified is only in seven counties currently, yep. and it needs to be state statewide. For, Folks on the council, um, you may recall we briefly referenced this report. It was not out yet at the right. October meeting, and then we met in Rutland in November, so we weren't able to uh, get a report. Uh, it would have been nice to get a, uh, a, an overview from Allison Hart at the, uh, in the secretary's office um, mm -hmm. on that. But. So if I'm looking at it, Eric, that's number five yes. of the of the of the five recommendations, what you're referencing is number five. Expand I'm, I'm family support right housing. Yep, statewide. that's number five. Two, okay. Um, I, I mean, it's worth a family supportive housing is a strong program that agency and the department supported. This is a recommendation that was not unanimous from the work group. Um, hence the little asterisk. Yeah, hence the asterisk. Just oh, okay. Uh, okay. Just as a note, as a side note, the. The work group included members, many officials from the administration on it, so that was one of the reasons why uh, some of the recommendations couldn't be, uh, that related to budget, couldn't be uh, unanimous. We understand. Okay, so Katie. Um, at the public hearing, we did hear some feedback around um, the education of homeless children and keeping them in school, and if we're going to be making this affordable housing and family homelessness, I don't know if there is anything that the council might want to note about um, the education aspect of homeless children. Uh, I wonder 
Is this the best? Is this the best place? The I'm only not other, sure. Yeah. The only. I mean, maybe under five trauma and family supports. Oh, that would be. Yeah. Would would it be available to there? I think that it would work in either one. I just um, if we're adding the family homelessness to that category, I think um, it would probably feel better to have it under that as opposed to trauma, um, just because it is directly dealing with homelessness. But I, I think it could go in either category. Yeah. Okay. We only have two over in that one, so we. Yeah, it might, it might stand out a little bit more in five is what I was kind of talking about. <coughs> but, um, well, I have a yeah. question. Does it family supportive housing help, help homeless families stay in the school district? Maybe not. Maybe that's not one of the services. No, it's not specifically designed to help people stay in the school district. It's just, it's but if that's one of the issues, if they, <coughs> so they would be trying to maintain the family in the, in the in house. Yes. In yes. housing, yes. So it would keep right. the kid in the school district. And, and unfortunately, that they would need to be able to access family supportive housing for that to impact them. And I think, uh, as uh, we just heard, because it's not in every county, that wouldn't necessarily be something that would um, alleviate that, I think. I mean, to just put it in context, at this moment in time, there are probably about 300 homeless families in Vermont, and family supportive housing serves families who were homeless, right? But family supportive housing caseload at this moment in time is about 100. So it's not to scale, I think, is the point that um, the Secretary of Hearts raised in that story. In my experience in the program was that it, it was very focused on your housing and, and your access to staying in housing and keeping you in housing. And um, the, the conversation around the education piece was more around giving you the number for places you could call that might potentially be able to help you. Mm -hmm. so, so can I just... So when I see, when I see or you know family supportive housing, what what comes to mind is Harbor Place for me, and am I getting that wrong? Yes, wrong. <laughs> Not totally okay. So I'm thinking no, that's this, okay. this is Harbor Place is is um, essentially a nonprofit motel operated by the Champlain they have a lot Trust of... that has a contract with the Department for Children and Families to um, to use that as its as a really affordable motel choice for folks who need emergency housing in Chittenden County. Family supportive housing identifies families within a community who are homeless and helps place them into housing and provides long-term support services for them in permanent housing. So it's it's just a different thing. Because I think of the services that are there, that it isn't just the hotel. That was That's what true. was an yes. attractive. So, it yes. was the wraparound. When I think of the supportive services, is that within that scope, they're not just at a hotel. They're there, and there's there's mm -hmm. you know somebody there for employment, and there's there's people there to assist. Uh, there's there's certainly point. more support at our yeah. place than there would be in a yeah, run-of-the-mill motel um, yes. where yeah. someone is you know in the motel thanks to a general assistance temporary housing voucher. It is very different that way, and people often graduate um, from Harbor Place into Champlain Housing Trust um, housing or, or other housing opportunities. But family supportive housing is more like what you heard from Ellen uh, in October, and okay. uh, the family that she supported <coughs> the program at the Upper Valley Haven in Hartford. Uh, I appreciate you setting me straight because I don't like to have a mistake. Could, could I give just a quick review of what, what are the differences? What kind of services if family is, is in a motel? with a voucher that's all they get or do they get other attention can they, i other can helps? i feel that yeah. since we yeah. administer this program so so um what are the so the services at harbor place would be services around housing search and placement around applying and finding for housing around identifying what are your barriers to getting into housing and trying to address those barriers quickly around getting connected to mainstream services like employment or mental health or substance use or whatever individualized issues are getting those connections made those would be you, those would be the kind of services that would be in place at when people are in emergency housing or emergency shelter like harbor place or or shelter family supportive housing is going to do some of the work to get people housed which is a little bit of that same housing navigation work and to get people connected to a range of services but then they're going to provide long-term support services individualized intensive home-based case management for high for families in in that permanent housing so that family gets leased up in housing 
they may have experienced homelessness. Other times they may got a lot of things going on, they're getting stabilized, they're gonna meet with them weekly, if not more. Um, they're gonna follow up and help coordinate and connect them to other services. Um, they're gonna liaison with the landlord in an ongoing way. So it's just, it's different kind of services. It's not transition services, it's longer term services. And, and NECA actually administers family supportive housing. Oh, but by contrast, the, 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 the family that just gets, gets a voucher and goes into a motel, they get none of that? In any in a motel other than she, other than housing yeah, place? Yeah. No, there are other families in motels do access housing navigation support. There's limits to what's available in communities, but a family supportive housing is a different program than just housing navigation. So yeah. and and I know in our agency that person, um, the case manager does everything that the family identifies that they need support in and I don't think it's like a one-size-fits-all program it's really individualized for that family's needs so we do a lot of advocacy for families in the school yeah. Um, yeah. we help parents do nighttime routines we offer individual and group um, financial literacy classes and parenting coaching so that it's really designed around what those Specific families needs. on that caseload need and it's not limited to so housing. No, no one just gets a yeah. voucher and the address of the motel and no, we say good luck. Tenant. No, no. They okay. they're not. And it's more individualized because it, the goal is to keep people housed and families together. Yeah. I would also say that the Family Supported Housing Program, as someone who's utilized it, um, they do a really great job of repairing relationships with service providers because a lot of times, um, I know for our family, we had a lot of um, difficult relationships prior to that. And so that person really helped us repair those relationships and build trust in systems and, and in providers, as well as the financial literacy piece was a huge um, step, really helping to understand how to budget, really helping to understand how to effectively budget and how to come back from maybe going out and buying something that you didn't need, but maybe had you know, we all have those things. Maybe it's a couple books from the bookstore, whatever that is, but really working through that with you in the moment as you're going through it so that you're not alone in it and you don't end up back in that spiral where things are out of control and you aren't able to access support. So it's really about building that trust and ensuring that, the, that you feel comfortable talking to your provider and letting them know where your struggles are so that they can help you in, in real time with the struggles as they're happening. So, well, you know, I've come in here after three days in budget adjustment, so I'm really, so we've been upstairs, and so we heard um, uh, a request to adjust the budget and do for the hotel vouchers because they're up 16,000 nights so far this year, and we haven't even gotten, you know, to, into where, and they're predicting, predicting a potential 25,000 more nights between now and the end of fiscal year. 20 was in July. So they're asking for an additional, from what we already funded last year, an additional 1.6, 1.2 million, 1.9, so you might put $2 million just to get readjusted. So there's, a, there's, there's something going on again, <coughs> even of all the supports that we've put into place, right, that, that there's that many um, hotel vouchers. I mean, we need to do it, but it's an indicator of where the system needs to be built on the other side stronger. I think part of it, <laughs> part of it is limited bed space in shelters. I know that in Burlington, as at the low barrier shelter, we're turning away anywhere from six to ten people every night, and those are people who can't access two on one for a number of reasons. And so I think that is very likely to continue to increase. Yeah, and two on one was funded and or recommended to be fully funded in budget adjustment for the rest of this year. So I'm going to make a very bad assumption that if the agencies are coming in with the $162,000 ask to fund 211 24-7 for the rest of 20, that when I see the budget in January, it should be fully funded and I think we've brought enough attention to it. I'm not can I just build on that? Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I did attach a letter, I did send a letter tonight. Okay, great. And mm -hmm. um, just to clarify, the 211 is funded through April for the 24 7. What oh. their business plan is um, is to 
be able to build capacity within the state of Vermont to provide the 365 24-7 service ongoing. That might cost a little bit more in the initial two years, but right now, rather than contracting out to these external contractors, which their performance is not what we can deliver in Vermont, and, and we can talk to Mary Ellen more about that, but um, that, that we're kind of, our money isn't going we could better spend that money by, by employing people in Vermont, by building our contact center, and then we would get the contracts from the other New England states and other states. So we would potentially bring revenue in, but it might take a year or two to bring that revenue in to offset the cost. And I believe that was put forth that plan to AHS. But I really appreciated your comments, Representative Wood, that it, it, it is, it's all of us, it's the whole state, so should this be more of a, a cross-agency or cross-sector Funding for 211 because we have many, many programs, Health Farm included, that yeah. utilize their services and it is essential. And I feel like this business model needs more voice and more um, discussion. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'll say is I just think Katie's right about including the homelessness and supports for kids, even if there's a lot under here, because it, I think the schools are bound to have an educational liaison or somebody that will do home visits. I mean, kids are homeless, and I think it is a homelessness topic. So let me just summarize what I've heard. Well, or I'll let your heart say something else. Just, just summarize what Katie put up. I think I do. Sorry. Just one, one addition to Representative Lanter's point um, about uh, the motel voucher uh, over, overage in the budget adjustment request. So, one of the things that's happening in addition to shelters, one of the reasons that shelters are full all the time is because um, it's hard to graduate folks out of shelter into permanent housing. Um, if one of the data points that we provided came from uh, Sarah's uh, uh, hot report um, is that the average length of stay, average length of stay in a shelter in Vermont is 52 days. Uh, again, this year it's the second year in a row uh, where it's been the longest, uh, longest shelter stay, longest average shelter <coughs> stay uh, over the last 18 years. Um, and that's an indicator of how backed up the system is because there's not enough affordable housing for people to go to. Um, and so that gets back to the first point of we also need more affordable housing um, to deal with that shortage so that people with the supports that are needed and with a voucher, if we can get it from the federal government or uh, from a state program, uh, together with a voucher and the support services, they, there needs to be more affordable housing for them to go to as well. Right, okay. Okay, so let me take a stab at uh, summarizing what we have said for in, term, in terms of what we would put in our recommendations. So uh, we would keep the three that we already have, and then we would add um, uh, a fourth one that would encourage a flexible use of um, uh, Vermont rental subsidies for reach up families and reference the report of the uh, committee. We would add one that would um, recommend um, uh, a more comprehensive cross-sectoral funding for the 211 uh, program to make it 365, 24-7. And then we would add one that would, ref that would uh, recommend um, education supports for homeless children. Is that? Um, what about the number five from the AHS yes. report? Was that this one here. Oh, um, Expanded family supportive I think housing. Well, it's actually in there already, but you have it in there. Yes, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah that, that's number, that's C. Yeah, okay. yeah that's C. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank oh, you. Good. All right. All right, is that a fair summary of what we did? The yeah. only additional thing was adding homelessness to the, the title. Oh, and the title. Oh, yeah. And the, yeah. 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 Family homelessness. Okay. So, Katie, I don't, I don't know if Katie's going to have uh, a chance to look at the report, but um, recommendation number four is very specific also. Uh, in that report, um, and it's broader, but it, it references the Housing Opportunity Grant Program. And again, uh, it's, it wasn't one of the unanimous uh, recommendations, but it was a, a strong recommendation of those of us who were not, um, you know, not administration uh, officials. Uh, invest additional funding for housing case management services and retention via the Department of Children and Families Housing Opportunity Grant Program. So I think those two, four and five, go in, in that report go together. One is for HOP and it, the other. It kind of goes with our original that 3B is references HOP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the original one, it's. it's I, 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 the, the only reason I cite it is because it has this, I think, kind of an overarching statement about 
investing additional funding for housing case management services and retention. That that's sort well, of maybe, maybe we can just run maybe we can report. Yeah, it's or, or just or including case management. Including, yeah, 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 yeah including case management. It, that's what's yeah. provided both through HOP and through family supported housing. It's so we can reference sort of binds them together. Yeah, right. with a link. Yes, I think that would be better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any any other comments about the section? <laughs> We're trucking along here. All right, let us move on then to uh, next section number four, which is economic empowerment and employment supports. We had a number of recommendations. Uh, a, increasing the minimum wage in Vermont alongside corresponding adjustments and benefits eligibility to avoid a net loss to beneficiaries. B, the adoption of paid family and medical leave legislation. C, increasing funding for economic programs that create jobs and build savings and assets, for example, the Micro Business Development Program and the Vermont Match Savings Program. D, investing in workforce training and financial literacy education. E, supporting transportation-related public initiatives, including increasing public transportation options, increasing access to reliable and affordable vehicles, and providing license fee and fine remediation assistance. And F, increasing reach up financial assistance for households to 100% of their basic needs based on the current cost of living with automatic increases for inflation and G, reversing the reduction in reach up grant amounts for households where an adult with a disability is receiving supplemental security. Okay, let's go one by one, shall we? Um, that was, oh, that's a lot there. Uh, and I can just say that we heard from Karen, and Karen provided a really nice, I she's got them. several, good, so she can speak so to I'm her. I'm going to pass this out. Okay, that's about reach up specifically. Right these, these are, well, it's about reach up and, and all of the economic, but Amy may want to speak to the reach up. I okay, so just I'll read the voices thing, and I think they make some good suggestions for tweaking the language. Um, I'm, I'm sorry it's not uh, in color so you can't see the changes, but they're very brief. I'm passing, I'm also passing out, in addition to some of the recommended changes, I'm passing out a one-page excerpt from the Reach Up report that I put in there that talks about um, uh, financial uh, capabilities, financial future programs of the Reach Up participants. And I'm also passing out um, the testimony from Travis Pullen about the uh, uh, volunteer income tax assistance program. So what I'm suggesting is in the economic empowerment employment, and I did send this to Katie and Mike and Diane, I did not send it uh, to you because I think you said you were out of town, so. Um, and uh, I, I didn't send this specifically to Mike se uh, separately, so I will do that, I just don't have it on this computer. So, um, absolutely continue the, the minimum wage, and I think the group, uh, Voices has some language on that. Adoption of paid family leave, Voices has some language on that. In item C, um, in terms of increasing funding for economic programs, I, I suggested adding the word increase base funding because for the past three years, we have increased funding in, in micro-business, but it's, it's always been a one-time. And so I think it's important for people who uh, administer those programs to be able to count on that money in the base. And we have had it in the base at one point in time, and then either the House puts it in, the Senate takes it out, or something like that. So absolutely appreciate the extra $100,000 that has been in for micro business and, and the addition to the IDAs. Um, but th that should really be something that should be in the base if, if uh, folks are willing to go along with that. In section D, investing in workforce training and financial literacy education, I am proposing adding in between training uh, and the financial literacy education is adding financial capability programs that is different than the financial literacy curriculum that is taught in the education system. Uh, and and that's, um, uh, that, that's something that's part and parcel of every economic program, whether it's, it, it's teaching people how to save, whether it's teaching them you know, uh, how to uh, uh, you know, um, repair their credit, um, but it, it's just, just a, a number of financial education and capabilities for adults, for programs uh, that work part and parcel with, with um, trying to get them um, uh, to, to financial security, and, and that one page excerpt talks about the, the Financial Futures Program 
for reach of participants that has been really, really successful. Um, so I'm, I'm just adding financial capability because it is different from financial literacy education curriculum. Um, e is fine. Um, I am suggesting adding, um, adding one section to support funding for tax preparation programs for low income, for example, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. You'll see in that report from Travis where the state, through OEO, did give um, the community action agencies and the people that administer the uh, uh, income tax assistance program additional monies to do that. I mean, this is a program that saves low-income taxpayers upwards of $8 million in tax credits and, and um, uh, assistance tax, tax rebates. Um, and uh, that money was provided through OEO. It was discretionary money. It's not necessarily going to be there again, or maybe Sarah can speak to that. But um, I just think this is, this is something we should hopefully have even the tax department or someone in state government take a look at. They operate on a, a very minimal, less than $50,000 grant from the federal government. Um, and, and what this program does with the volunteers and, and, and doing all that is just, just tremendous for low-income folks and, and, and uh, they certainly can use more resources. Um, and I moved the reach up to item G and I was hoping that Voices um, would, would recommend, uh, there's been a couple of groups that have been meeting about reach up changes and we, as you know that we did do some significant um, um, changes from last year, but in the, in voices under under reach up um, in that document that they sent out, um, first paper, right? So they they are are suggesting the language I think uh, increased cash assistance to Vermont's most vulnerable families to the current basic needs standard and eliminate the seventy seven dollars a month penalty for families with an adult who, uh, who has a disability, you should change that language um, to with disabilities instead of uh, disabled. Uh, so um, uh, we certainly would, would um, I certainly support that language. Um, it, it recognizes what we, we have done in the legislature for that, especially eliminating the $77 a month that it, it is something that um, is policy that never should have been passed to begin with. But, um, uh, it was originally 125 deduction in, in, in uh, people's reach up benefit because they were receiving some disability income. Uh, we have finally reduced that to 77, uh, which means that those families unfortunately don't get the, the benefit of the increase, um, kind of brings them with par with what they received before. They don't get the benefit of the increase in, in reach up assistance um, while that tax still remains. So. Uh, that would be uh, my recommendation. I don't know if Amy wants to add anything to the reach up piece. No, I think you covered it well. Starting with the we propose would probably be the language that we would choose along with that top part. Um, oh, Justine, to pay oh, yeah. leave and uh, yeah, the language that uh, voices suggest is, is great for each of those. I think it more defines. Um, so on that very top, this, this on visually, this top to replace for H. But we'll be replacing G, but but also they have changes. Be a new H if we followed your other. Yeah. yeah, they have changes in uh, family and medical leave insurance. They suggest they suggest some uh, a di just a different line for for uh, family and medical leave. They say provide economic support and job security to families facing a serious illness or a bond with a new child, um, and and that can go under B, the adoption of paid family leave. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I'm taking my yeah. Yeah. yeah, we also suggest using a supplemental poverty measure and just up, um, coming up with a Vermont specific one, if possible. I don't know if that fits into this section as much, but um, just a better indicator of the balance of services and need um, gives us a better picture of how families are able to, ma to navigate. Okay. And, yes. One of the things I liked about the language from the last recommendation was that it said um, increasing reach of financial assistance for households to 100% of their basic needs just because I, I like mm -hmm. that it's making clear that we're eliminating the rateable reduction. Mm -hmm. So we both want to eliminate the rateable reduction and 
increase the basic needs um, budget to so that it's the current budget. Mm -hmm. So I just I, I just would like to have that one hundred percent of needs in there. Possibly. That's the current. Yeah. That's and that's the current. That's what's in the. That was what was in the yeah the mm -hmm. last. Yes. Oh, it is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. At the public oh, uh, okay. I was just hearing <laughs> this year and last year, we heard a lot about the benefit cliff yeah. and the struggle that folks who are living with a disability are having with trying to return to the workforce. And so I just wonder if there is anything or any language that we might want to consider including around either the benefit cliff or um, supporting increasing opportunities and access. Um, for disabled folks to return to the workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, A does reference the benefits with trying to raise the minimum wage about <coughs> to avoid a So I think part science. of the benefit cliff is also losing all of your disability or right. your supplemental right. income right. when you're just going back into the workforce, mm -hmm. especially um, because that could mean that if it doesn't work out for you or if for some reason you um, can't maintain that hours, you would not have the financial security, and would, at, unless you're in the Ticket to Work program, would have to go back through the disability process or potentially get involved in a um, process to ensure that you have that stability again. So there's some things, though, that are federal that we can't change, and there's other things that are Vermont-based, which right, we can impact. And then we have increased, we've allowed you to earn an extra $50, I think, in the last couple years. Yeah. Before your reach up benefits get get up, but maybe we want to look at increasing that again. I, I think yeah, um, that, that was um, relating to what you just said, Karen, in terms of what we have done. I think I think it's in importance, especially since this is the second year of the biennium, to reflect the action that was taken in the first year. Mm -hmm. So things about like the the SSI. Yeah, uh, change. That's why I liked right I liked what um, voices said because they recognized that it was reduced. That was reduced, right? Yeah. And yeah. and did, we did have an increase in reach up. And, and you did in reach up. So six, yeah. uh, I just think we should put the like we're doing yeah. with child care. Put put what we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely I, I can that. work with Katie on that too. Okay. Uh, so yes. Yeah, the other thing I would like to see is. Um, with regard to increasing the minimum wage, if we could say increasing the minimum wage so that it's consistent with a livable wage. Mm -hmm. um, the concern being that, you know, if we say increase it to 15 by whatever, 20, 30, we, <laughs> it's won't, not, we won't get there, right? Um, and I had another thought about that. Well, I guess I would also say increase the minimum wage for all workers. Um, so that, that that would be my suggestion, so that we don't eliminate, we don't um, exclude high school workers and tipped wages. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, because in A, it doesn't, it's, it's implied that it's everybody. Increase minimum wage in Vermont alongside the adjustment, right? So in terms of, um, of putting, yeah. recognizing with the legislature, do you want to do that in the actual recommendation or do you just want to put it in, in some of the stuff explaining it saying you know that the legislature increased reach up to you know by such and such an amount and 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 reduce the the reduction uh, to 77 do you want to just say that in, in the body in or do you want yeah, to put it yeah, in yeah, the like narrative the, narrative the pattern is right. to do it in the narrative yeah. okay. uh Erhard, did you you well, that? yeah just to um was one of our priorities uh as well to look at the income Income disregard and also the asset limits, which was another uh, factor that um, the General Assembly has, has um, de uh, increased the, uh, the amount asset. of assets that someone can have uh, who's on, on reach up uh, over the last few years. So the, the two kind of go hand in hand. And yeah. uh, I, I would urge um, putting both of those uh, into the recommendation. Okay. So, so are you saying increase the income disregard? For or yeah. examine it or? I, I think in, continuing to increase the income disregard, which uh, helps with the benefit clips um, issue. Okay. Okay. So I think about how to summarize what we said here. Um, well, I, I think we could go off of what um, Karen passed out uh, to us. Do we, so A and B, well, B, B, I think, with the recommendation was to change the uh, language to the voices language regarding 
uh, family medical leave. So we just, we just add, add that and then to adoption of paid family leave. I think you can keep the the adoption of paid family leave and medical leave legislation, which provides Audits, economic and support and job security, security yeah. for families facing, you know, just yeah. Yeah, we just add right to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then C, we'd add work base funding. D, we'd add financial capability programs. E is the same. Be a new F regarding tax preparation programs. Yep. G would um, be the old F. Yeah, it would be the old F. With, we're okay with? Yeah, I think we're okay with. I don't know the voices. And the board the voices uh, 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 added. added, but Sandy wanted to keep the hundred percent. Yeah. Well, that's if you start so with yeah. yeah. Those Sorry. Those yeah. Together. Okay. So and the new G, what was previously F, would read increase cash assistance to Vermont's most vulnerable families to one hundred percent of basic needs and eliminate the seventy-seven dollar a month penalty for families with an adult who has a disability. Is that right? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. yeah, that's good. And I was a little bit confused on A. Um, I, I think I heard changes along the lines of increasing the minimum wage for all workers in Vermont to be consistent with the level of wage alongside corresponding adjustments in benefit eligibility to avoid a net loss to benefits, including loss of disability benefits. Is that accurate? No, right. no. It was more so the reach up, right? Yeah, I, I think not that last okay. part, but the the rest of what you said. The rest is fine. Okay. Yeah. Should we put just yeah. somehow put the term benefits cliff in there? So that's that's what we're addressing. Right. So we're trying the to. Benefits why don't we just to say that? The net loss of benefits. Well, yeah, because right. people know the term benefits cliff. That makes sense to them. Okay, so to avoid. Perpetuating the benefits. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. So, okay. All right. Click. And then the H. So what used to be G oh. is now H. Reversing the reduction in reach up grant amounts. Of, oh no! But no, we've already covered that. Right? We've already covered that in the seventy-seven dollars. But yes. Earhart wanted to. But then Earhart wanted to add an H, which was to. Well, it could be part of reach up. Yeah. Reach up. It's it's a subset of the reach up. Yeah, it might be. So we could, so H is then included in the income disregard and assets limit. That's going to be the. Well, that makes G awfully unwieldy, I think. Can we make it a separate one? I'd rather Where, I don't one. see any H. Is it, am I missing something? No, it should be. 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 <laughs> when I, when you get two G's, I know I've actually got two G's. I moved so. the, I got the G. I crossed up the G and I made it an H because you bumped in that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so does that change? The alphabet is Yeah, the yeah. mom will change the alphabet. <laughs> that's our, that's our. There'll be no V's in there. Yeah, that's okay. Just one thing on the minimum wage. Uh, so we're part of the um, coalition around minimum wage as well. And, and one of the things that um, you know I think that became pro potentially problematic uh, last year in the passage was the issue of. Um, nonprofits uh, and others that provide social services, uh, especially to folks with disabilities, and the, uh, pay uh, the, the pay for them. And if we do raise uh, to a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, there's a potential there that you know some organizations are not current that are state funded are currently not able to provide that. Uh, we uh, you all have heard testimony from nursing homes, from community um, uh, from community care homes, from various various providers. So. I think we should probably add uh, a statement in there that the state of Vermont should pay all of its workers a livable wage without sacrificing the quality of or access to social services and maybe also include um, workers that, um, it's not just the state of Vermont, but it's also the, the, the nonprofits that are providing essential services. I don't disagree with you at all on that, mm -hmm. having been, but I'm just, of this being the Getting poverty piece, we might be just drifting off into a little, different yeah. zone and, and that, you know, the minimum wage and its impacts um, in the those in poverty and strengthening families. I was just going to stay in that 
Not that I disagree with that. Un understood, but of course, great. folks in poverty receive some of those services, and you don't want those yeah. services to be okay. impacted. We're well, good. maybe maybe that would be something for the narrative uh, to yeah flesh yeah. out. Uh, yeah. You know that a little bit. Mm -hmm. That we recognize yeah. that the, that the increase is going to yeah. go beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and, people in the actual and people in poverty I provide some of those services yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to, uh, so it's, it's not going to benefit them if their hours get reduced. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. right. right. Okay. Okay. Good point. All right. Okay. Are we all satisfied with that? Nice job. Yeah. Yeah. That's very exciting. Yes. Thank you, Karen. That was very helpful to have it written. Okay, moving on to number five, trauma and family supports. Uh, made two recommendations uh, to support and monitor the implementation of the Agency of Human Services Act 43 Childhood Trauma Response Plan. And secondly, to support increased funding for parent child centers and their two generation approach supporting the five protective factors. Um, have we made. <laughs> so yes, what, what we have Auburn's now. So Act 204, passed in 2018, was what um, followed Act 43, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the the response to the response plan included a response to Act 43, um, and included. Act 204, which formed the role that I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I don't know if we want to reference Act 204 in there, Katie, or not, but that um, might clarify some of that. That, yeah. that there are two pieces, two pieces of legislation to look at in addressing trauma um, through the agency. And then, um, then I would just say that I, I didn't get a chance to report uh, verbally to you all, but I did send to you a slide deck that won't make sense because <laughs> because I didn't send you all my notes with it um, and I wasn't able to present on it. But it, it's just it's a it was a quick uh, sort of um, there's only one slide of accomplishments and that's not even half of what's happened since I've been there. But um, and then what else is included under my name? Um, like Mike said, um, you're putting the documents under our, our names. Um, is Act 204, Act 43, and the response plan. They're all there as well as um, the agency's trauma policy, um, so that you can see that there as well, and then my little board slide, slide deck, because I knew I was only gonna have like 15 minutes or whatever to talk to you all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all, that should all be under my name, I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, what's, what's really neat on that note is if you go to witness in the, in the main page, you know, where you are on the Advisory Council on Child Poverty, it goes down through it when you click on it. You can see everything that she's done. So, I'm just looking. Uh, 204 is there. Oh, so 43 is not there. Because the document about trauma, that's that's the AHS uh, um, so trauma and support services policy. Yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. That's over here on the side. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you and, go. and these three are just static okay. on the page all there the time. So, so. And then, and then the report is my slide deck, which is just really small. Um, yeah, yeah. Which has some of the accomplishments since, since uh -huh. I've been there. So, so uh, then that would sort of change the age of support and monitor the, the two pieces of legislation. And right. and I'd be happy to give a more detailed report at some point in yeah. the future yeah. of, in, you know, like going down through that response plan so you have a better understanding of what the agency is, is working on. Um, going forward, I just do want to say that I've had a preliminary conversation with the secretary about developing a, a statewide table that will map uh, and strategize um, what the state is doing across Vermont with regard to trauma and resilience. And, um, and so I'm looking at sort of garnering support for the development of that, that table um, to um, make sure that we have right now a really clear view of what is happening, where the gaps in services, um, that where the gaps in services are um, to address trauma and resilience in families, children and families. Um, specifically because Act 204 
in Act 204, the General Assembly um, really <coughs> stated its support for a public health approach to address childhood adversity and toxic stress in families across Vermont. Um, and so it's hard to do that without knowing what's out there and then to, mm -hmm. and then the need is to assess the overlaps and gaps, um, the duplications and then be able to coordinate through evaluation um, and supporting the current state of uh, the workforce that's doing the work around trauma and resilience as well. So, um, so my hope is to create that, um, that cross-sector table statewide with statewide leadership um, and, um, and, and to do that work. So I just wanted to give you that forward momentum thought. Great. So would you say support? So how would you update those two? Yes, that mm -hmm. A and B. A and B. To yeah. reflect. Uh, well, these are all other things. Yeah, these are all other things. I can, I can give Katie some language for both. But the first one, um, let me go back to. But we need a little back. bit of a hint so we can. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. So the first one, support and monitoring the implementation of the Agency of Human Services Act 43 Childhood Trauma Response Plan. I think that's still what it's called. And the requirements um, of Act 204? Um, yeah, and in, in meeting the requirements of Act 204. Yeah. Um, that'd be great. And then, I don't know if you want, I don't. I just threw that out there, um, where I'm going in the future with that um, statewide table. Um, is that in the requirements of Act 204? No. No. So, so okay. idea that That's just something I'm, I'm doing okay. as part of my role. Act 204 requires a public health approach across, to, to address these things across Vermont. Mm -hmm. And so my response to that is we need a statewide table to establish this in this way. You know. mm -hmm. so, um, so that's part of the Act 204. Um, the Act, the Act 204 uh, purpose of that of that Act. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. You we know. should state that or not. I mean, I, it seems too specific, specific. to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because yeah. you might be asking part of the narrative. It's, narrative that it's more of it's more of a you know reporting to you about like the future yeah. response to Act 204. Yeah. It would probably come out if we said, hey, we need to know more about Act 204. That would come out as a part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Sounds good. Great. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Uh, supporting. Yes, Karen. Do we want to add either here or under the education piece something about monitoring the special ed stuff or uh, looking at uh, you know the the uh, peer peer navigation assistance for families with disabilities or something like that? Uh, recognizing what Katie said, or uh -huh. um, I, I don't know if we just want to monitor it or if we want to look at. Well, we have, I mean, we have the whole new special ed law that right, is, right. you know, in the process of yeah. being enacted. I mean, you know, well, well, well you're a, you're you're an education yeah, exactly. person. Yeah. You say well, they're both. Yeah, and not well, yeah, I am too. Yes, yes. There you go. You guys, I, I you guys think the know. other advisory board for special ed is is reviewing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Act one seventy three. Right. Right. Yeah. Which so is that a funding the, mechanism it kind of really changes. Sure. Yeah. Of special education. Um, it feels like it gets to some of what Katie right. was talking about in terms of being able to intervene earlier without having to. Well, it will definitely does. get to service delivery for sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But well, I, I think, think the funding the is, funding a, will open is up. an issue yeah. as we speak. Right. Is it no. one seven? The funding will open up service yeah. delivery yes. a little different. But I think there's a gap with. So um, I think it's both in what we talked about with peer navigation and training mm -hmm. um, and funding for. You know, for not generation of families, the family network, but I think it's also um, how do we get the training for special educators, right? Those teams are trained. The training that happens in school is for teachers to work with children. It's not for teachers to work with families. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a kind of a parallel. And who does, in whose role is that? Is it a you know collaboration with human uh, with agency of human services and special educators? I think that that speaks. Um, to kind of going at a problem from both sides because I think sending um, trained advocates in loaded for bear against our well, school administrator, I mean, it's not really a good setup that's for part success. Of, you know, Act 173 again is having, <coughs> having licensed special educators. Sort of. So it's about expanding services so that can be provided by um, lots of different people in schools. So can I just, 
I was going to offer. Well, okay. okay. Well, I, let's Welcome. just see you from Katie, and then, okay. we'll, and then we'll have you offer. I I would just following up on what Karen said, maybe ask the council to consider if there's any language around recognizing the impact or the trauma that families are navigating. And I don't know the language we want to use, but it is definitely something that is a growing challenge for families in poverty in Vermont in navigating it, whether the funding comes through, whether we make all these great changes, but the trauma is still there. Mm -hmm. And the impact on families in poverty and their ability to have um, financial stability and the resilience of, of both the parents and the kids, I think are, are important aspects of that conversation. And so perhaps- So yeah, I want that quickly see. So I was like, I was just trying to remember when we didn't want to like totally duplicate everything that was happening. There was a summer study that was on the, remember the minimum wage bill, you know, like our poverty council cared about it a great deal and especially what was gonna come out of it. But we didn't have to replicate everything in, in our world. So I'm thinking that that might be a path that we could go with. What was it, the education, the advisory council for Act 173 that we would want to make sure that we are aware of and um, keep 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 in, keep ourselves informed on over the year, right? Well, that we don't have to replicate what's going on in been, there. I've been to but at least three of their meetings. And I, and and state and board, it, we've taken yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. testimony so, from them every month. Um, it, it's really Act One Seventy Three is really about funding. It's right. not and expanding yeah. service delivery. It is not about. Well, so I would recommend that on C we recognize that you know the the the, the impact uh, on families. Um, you know, experience, well, Katie's piece, that they need to recognize that this is an issue for keeping their children in school. How do we word that? I, I think it might be, I don't know how you want to word it, but I think the importance of recognizing the impact on the family unit as a whole um, in, in the trauma piece of it, because I do think that one, it impacts the kid's ability to be in school, consistently, but it's also impacting parents' ability to stay and work and to yeah. have have their income and be able to provide for the basic needs of their families. Well, how about if we make a little more positive statement and say that we support uh, you know, uh, improvements in peer-to-peer -peer navigation and training for teachers to mitigate the trauma um, However, you want to perpetrate it all. Yes. 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 Even back in the report, like we didn't want to name a place, but we did say, you know, um, where we had increasing rental that supports, for example, increasing funding for, you know, and then there's like, for example, increasing funding for the Vermont Family Network would be an example of where to help with that. Am I right on that? Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I think there's any, there's a number of agencies, Vermont Families Federated Family, I can't. Yes, thank you. Um, um, there's a number of them that do support it, but Vermont Family Network is definitely yeah. one that would be the primary in the state around the education. Piece. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if you want to mention them specifically. No. Yeah, I, I don't I think, think so. you want to yeah. talk about yeah. what the issue is that you're trying to address as assistance for families um, yeah. and, 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 and supporting the work that's done in the field. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, I want to, um, I'm not weighing in on the recommendation per se, but I just want to add that families experiencing the complexity of trauma and trauma exposure and toxic stress in general benefit from peer navigation, peer supports. And so, and I, I'm saying across the board, not just families ex with special needs, but families, right. yeah. you know, with foster children, foster care children, you know, families right. experiencing that complexity. So just taking up even a higher level, just to acknowledge the, the benefit of that kind of shared connection, mm -hmm. right? Um, which we know is a protective factor. Um, builds a protective factor and um, builds resilience in those families. So yeah, just that to, might be good in the Yeah, I think that's the key is the um, assistant, yeah. the peer navigation for the families mm -hmm. either experiencing poverty or with disabilities or any anything. Foster care, any kind yeah. of complex yeah. complex yeah. Right. trauma. Yeah.
Okay, so that's adding one, but let's go back to B. Yeah, uh, so support uh, increased funding for parent child centers and the five year factor factors. Is yeah. that something so we just want to This is where we would have a difficult time, I think, um, trying to elaborate what exactly was done last year. It was, yeah. Mm. Uh, because we, we, yeah, we took it away and we gave back. Base and funding we, and then we took away with the left hand and gave back to the, with the right hand. Yeah. So uh, I, don't, I don't know center. exactly how to say I don't. Yeah. And the net was a, what was the net? The net was the net was a loss. minus, wasn't it? 200K. Yeah, 200, that's what I thought. 200K loss? 300. 300, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, we should keep this yeah. in the problem. Yeah. So, yeah, I, mean, I feel like we need to. Yeah, I mean, we, and in the narrative, we might say something about what happened. Is all the stuff of <laughs> shifting the reach up? Guidance to the yes, the, the, that was part of yeah, that is, was is the that a fait now? Is that because that confused things also? It, it did. Oh, the case yeah. management. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 that was in the budget bill. Well, oh, that and that, that that case management report is out, right? Do, do I read this correctly? Though that at, at this point, the damage is done on that. I I, I thought that was a bad idea, but that it's it's a fait accompli I think that's or, really that or should do we want to give the case management back to the Parent child centers. I think they need I don't know. Need money. Money. I don't want to wait until that level of yeah. we, We'd like them back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, could be, that could be any, that could be read into the supporting increased funding. Yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah. So much, they need that, to, as you know. I'm, not, yeah. I'm talking out of the way there. Okay. We're running out of time. So is that okay, okay. then? For this final. Uh, all right, so just trying to think, uh, we've given uh, Kate McLean quite a uh, task here. Um, so we need to see you know, the final version before we sign off on it. I, do you think we can do that by email? Should we meet again in January? What, um, um, Madam Chair, but before we go there, can I ask a question? Are we gonna do any kind of, uh, you know, our benchmarks that we set? Are we gonna report on the benchmarks? We don't. We don't need to. to. I know we don't need to. I heard you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and we just gonna we just gonna send them, and then we're gonna wait to twenty twenty three to to report on them. Yes. Yeah, two years. We're required to do it at the the halfway mark. Halfway so five yeah. years and ten years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll we'll just wait to see if we're making any progress for five years. Okay. Well, maybe we you know we can. Progress is slow. <laughs> So I would say, yeah. I guess we'll wait till next year. Next year. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. So how do you feel about, do you want to take a look by email, or do you want to, where were you going to meet? Last year we met in early January, just to review. I don't know if email is going to do it. Yeah, it seems like. I don't know if legally we can do it. Or I don't know if it matters either way. It's due January first. Yeah. Um, so so we don't have to ask her. <laughs> we missed that deadline last week. Right. Yeah. 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 So we. Was that yeah. So we're already. We're already. How about us do the first? Usually they make you want to do the first. Yeah. 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 Right. We need to get the first. Yeah. We need to get the first. Yeah. We need to get the first. Yeah. Yeah. You can make that change in the on call. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. We but but otherwise, it's like we have to change um, it in legislation. Now. So, yeah. what yeah. would be. It's so cold in here. I think that's our impetus to get Right. So, let's talk about a meeting. Let's talk about an area meeting. I'll just point out that, you know, we, so, the first week, there's very little to actually do. It's yeah. a good time to get to work. It's a good time to do. It's very ceremonial. <laughs> it's also <laughs> that's true. It's, yeah, so we start on the seventh. Um, so we're in the building already. It's, it's just you know. Yeah, it's right. just like what time and what could we meet on the sixth? Before oh, oh, people? No, I have other dogs. Yeah, I'll do, I'll another dog. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Um, so what about during lunchtime? There must be some common free time for I don't know, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even various classes don't usually start till the second week, so yeah, like the ninth, which is a Thursday, which is Thursday, which is, Thursday. Which is that's why I said because today's that's state a, of the state. That's state of the state. Yeah. It's at two o'clock. Oh, it's at two. Yeah, we can meet before this. We can do one. And then is Mike still uh, here? 
Hey. Hey. hey! Mike, is there any room in the inn on, on the night? <laughs> at noon? And a space for us to like meet, like here? Oh, rooms. Yeah. <laughs> so with the state of the state, they tend to take over You know what it is? It's yeah. going to be security. They, they tend to take over room security. 10 and 11 for, for a minute. It's just a regular right. community. I would avoid the night. All right. It's the security in the. It's the security in the. What building. about the? Well, what about oh, the? What about the old there, there's, natural there's resources? House, <laughs> at, there's house natural resources. We could what probably squeeze there. Okay, it'll be a tight squeeze. Well, how about Wednesday the eighth? How about yeah, <laughs> Wednesday the eighth at noon. No, people, some nine. people, no. Okay. Yeah. They're changing their mind to the eighth. Yeah. Okay. No. We. St well. Would you like to be in here? Yeah, Wednesday the Wednesday the eighth at noon in here. Some people can't make it though. Uh, I'm not a voting member though. Okay. So scheduling wise, the eighth, um, this room is used at noon and in the morning. So if you did uh, from eight to nine, so if you did something between nine and noon or after one p.m., this I can reserve this room. We don't this know where we're doing in committees. We could be on the floor passing paid family leave at that moment. No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every day. I, never I mean, know. those are bold. Yeah, yeah. Do, um, nice at noon. They're switching what had been the House Natural Resources into the Ethan Allen. So House Natural is now a free committee room. Yeah. Okay. So right. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's why we're just talking about this. Yeah. Well, no, right. All right. 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 So noon on the night. Well, TV general warm up. Everybody's in tight spaces. Okay. Standing room in the house. All right, so House Natural Resources. You'll send out a Thursday. I absolutely will. Right. I have to request at that you start at the okay. And so there are, just a reminder, there are voting members and non-voting members. So if you're a non-voting member and you have nothing to change about the report, I you would could, imagine that you could be excused. Yeah. Yeah. We just need to have a quorum. Mm -hmm. How long would you like oh, you to reserve the room for? An hour. On the 8th or the 9th? The 9th. Yeah. So it's on Thursday the 9th at noon, House Natural Resources. And then if you're staying for the okay. state of the state. Okay, and uh, I I was told there was a press conference right outside yes. our door. Is it still happening? If it's still happening, you go carefully. If it's still happening, you'll have, to, you'll have to go somewhere else. Go another way. Yeah, photo bomb the press conference. Just one last uh, request. So, yeah. Folks who did submit something to um, represent Landfear, could that get posted? Yes, yeah. So let's, yeah. Let, so Mike, let's yeah. make sure all the, all those, all the things. So like I the got this thing. Karen, could Sarah, get yeah. Oh, Karen, I just, and Janet, and Mike. That was the four. You were gonna send me the I just sent you the minimum wage leverage. He made sure Mike gets all four. If you will find the sending, yeah. I can ask because I know you got them, but you won't know which one. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate all your hard work. Happy holidays and Happy New Year. And we'll see you in January.